In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the great feast of St. Andrew. He is the apostle and martyr that was with his brothers, St. Peter. And they were fishermen, and their father uh, was a fisherman as well, who lived in the area of Capernaum. And he was a devout follower of St. John the Baptist. And St. John the Baptist, after pointed out our Lord, saying, Echad news day, there's the Lamb of God. And our Lord walked on as if to go somewhere. And the follower of St. John the Baptist, St. Andrew, and believed to be St. John, they ran after our Lord. They ran up to him, behind him. And our Lord turns around and says, what do you seek? What do you want? And they said, Master, where do you live? So they went and spent the day and into the night with our Lord. And St. Augustine says in admiration, what did they hear? What words did they hear from the Savior in this first meeting with Christ? With what zeal, with what happiness they would have heard our Lord. Uh, and then by this meeting, St. Andrew is convinced he's the Messiah. And then he can't wait to tell his brother, St. Peter. At that time, he was Simon. And he said to him, Simon, we found the Messiah. We found the treasure. So St. Andrew is praised for being the introducer of the Messiah. St. John the Baptist points him out. St. Andrew chases him, speaks with him, and just hearing his words, he's convinced he's the Messiah. So he introduces St. Peter, and then later all the apostles will be gathered. So it's very fitting that here at the beginning of Advent, which is this Sunday, St. Andrew introduces us into Advent. He introduces us into preparing for the child Jesus. So the great St. Andrew, he will witness the miracle of the 153 gallons of wine. He will be there for the multiplication of the loaves. He will witness the miracles, the sermons, the parables of our Divine Lord. And St. Andrew... He will also later witness, of course, the part of the agony of the garden, and he would be one of those to run off. And he would certainly repent of this and uh, see our Lord at the resurrection, touch his wounds. And he was out fishing when our Lord appeared after many of his apparitions on the, on the, the lake of Tiberiades. And he, he would have been there to hear our Lord's words with his resurrected body when our Lord prepared them breakfast. Breakfast, the menu was hot, fresh bread and fresh cooked fish. Which to our sugary breakfasts don't sound so great, but actually it's a very good breakfast. It's actually a very good fresh fish caught right out of the, the lake, cooked over an open fire. And bread cooked over, heated over an open fire, it's, it's quite delicious. So our Lord would have made them a very good breakfast. And probably with, uh, if St. Paul tells us, season your good works with salt, certainly our Lord would have seasoned the fish with good salt. And so St. Andrew, filled with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, he was the brother of St. Peter, he will be sent by St. Peter into the, we would, today it would be Kazakhstan, part of Ukraine, and the Slovak countries. That's where St. Andrew preached mostly. And then he would also go to Greece and preach there, and there he will be martyred at Patra, or sometimes called Patra, Patras. And there he was crucified on the cross, and the cross was the shape of a big X. When St. Andrew saw the cross, listen to his words. 
these powerful words from the Roman breviary. He was ordered to sacrifice to the gods. And if he wished, if he did this, it would do him much good and he'd be set free. St. Andrew replied, daily I sacrifice to the omnipotent God, not the flesh of bulls, nor the blood of goats, but the spotless lamb upon the altar, of whose flesh all the, the host of believing eat, the lamb who is sacrificed yet remains living and entire. So what is this but the Mass? The Apostle answering his judges, I daily offer the Mass. Tell that to the Protestants and Lutherans and Jehovah Witnesses who reject the Catholic Mass. Tell that to the Navasordos who have distorted the Catholic Mass. St. Andrew and all the Apostles offered the sacrifice of the Mass and he nails it, what it really is. Daily I sacrifice it's not a meal, it's not a singing session, it's not a hand-clapping session. I sacrifice, that's what the Mass is, the sacrifice, and it's an action. Daily I sacrifice, daily I do this sacrifice to the omnipotent God, not facing man, but facing God. Not the flesh of bulls, nor the blood of goats, which was the old pagan sacrifices, but the spotless lamb upon the altar is sacrificed, of whose flesh all the faithful believing eat at Holy Communion. Here we have the whole Catholic faith handed down from the Trinity to Christ, who became flesh, God the Son, hands it right to the Apostles, and the Apostle is already established tradition. I offer the Mass given by Christ. And all those who believe eat his flesh, the flesh of the lamb who was sacrificed, yet remains living and entire. The mass is the living sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when you eat his flesh and drink his blood in Holy Communion, it's not a dead piece of meat. You're, you're receiving the living, burning heart of Jesus Christ the King. His divine face, his sacred wounds, his burning heart, his sacred immaculate virginal flesh under the appearance of bread and you also drink his precious blood you're united to the divine fire of the sacred heart of jesus so the abbreviary continues whereon whereupon Aegeus, the judge on fire with rage ordered saint andrew to be thrown into prison the populace of the city would have released St. Andrew gladly had he not quieted the mob, beseeching them most vehemently not to deprive him of the crown of martyrdom, for which he longed and which was now so near. Not long after this, St. Andrew was brought before the court, where he extolled the mysteries of the cross and rebuked the wickedness of the proconsul under Aegeus, who could who, who bear it no longer. He ordered that St. Andrew be raised upon a cross and die like Christ. St. Andrew was then taken to the place of execution. As soon as he saw the cross, still some distance away, he began to address it fervently, saying, and these words are chanted in the Vespers of today, O good cross, O bone crux, made beautiful for me by the body of my Lord. O cross, so long desired, so ardently loved, so ceaselessly sought, and now made ready at last for the soul longing for thee. Receive me from among men, restore me to my master, that he through you may welcome me, he who through you redeemed me. He was then fastened to the cross where he hung living throughout two days, never ceasing to preach the faith of Christ. So uh, many of the Catholic faithful and curious people came to the foot of the cross, watching St. Andrew tied to it, but he preached on the cross for, for two days in excruciating pain. And his cross was traditionally the cross of a big X. 
in the American history, the only, the only American iconography that carries the cross of, of the, any cross is the cross of St. Andrew, the Confederate flag of the South. But it's the flag of Britain, it's the flag of Scotland, there's the big cross of St. Andrew. At length he passed to him through that death by crucifixion for which he had longed. The priests and deacons of Achaia who have written of his passion testified that they saw and heard these details as they are related here. His relics were taken first to Constantinople during the reign of the Emperor Constantine. Later they were carried to Amalfi during the pontificate of Pope Pius II. Then his head was brought to Rome and placed in the Basilica of St. Peter. So the head of St. Andrew is in the Basilica of St. Peter. And for many centuries, the pieces of the wood of the cross on which St. Andrew was crucified, it was kept for most years, all the way up until 1980, in fact. His relics of the, of the crucifix, the crucifix that he was died on, was always kept in southern France at the monastery of Saint Victor in Marseille up until from the year 1250 and it was there all these centuries and then only on January 19th 1980 these relics were moved to Patra in Greece in the city where he was crucified so that's where uh, the, the relics are kept in a big reliquary, the shape of the big X of the cross, and people today come and, and venerate and kiss the wood that's still there. So the great Saint Andrew, he, he is mentioned curiously, he's mentioned in the Mass, only him, right after the consecration, during the libera, the prayer libera me, libera nos rather, which is said right after the pater noster. And I've always wondered why only St. Andrew? Is it possibly because St. Andrew was the introducer of all the apostles to Christ? He's the first to chase him and introduce his brother to him who would be our first pope. So he has a special place actually in the mass. And like his brother, St. Peter, and some other apostles, he was crucified. He was crucified. Let me just close by turning to Saint of Thomas Aquinas, who was speaking about the the lamb. Why is the why the lamb is so fitting, a figure of Christ crucified and the Mass? Why? And he says he quotes Saint Paul in one Corinthians. chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 5, verse 7, Christ our Pasch is sacrificed, therefore let us feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And St. Thomas says, the Paschal Lamb foreshadowed this sacrament of the Holy Eucharist in three ways. First of all, because it was eaten with unleavened loaves of bread, According to Exodus chapter 7 verse 8, chapter 12 verse 8, they shall eat flesh and unleavened bread, God commanded Moses and all the Israelites, eat the flesh of the lamb with unleavened bread. So you have the association of eating bread with eating this sacrificed lamb, which is a direct prefiguring of the Holy Eucharist. Because we eat the living flesh, which is the sacrificed lamb. And then secondly, it was Im the lamb was immolated by the entire multitude of the children of Israel on the 14th day of the moon. And this was a figure of the passion of Christ, who is called the lamb on account of his innocence. So the lamb is innocent and pure, and Christ is innocent and pure. And on the 14th day of the moon, which was the figure of the Passion of Christ, because that's the same time of Good Friday. 
the, the day Christ was crucified, the 14th day of the moon. And then thirdly, the lamb is the most perfect figure because it shows the effect of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Because by the blood of the Paschal lamb, the children of Israel were preserved from the, from the exterminator. And who's the exterminator in Latin? Exterminator, the destroying angel. What was his job? He was commanded by God to kill all the firstborn animals, all the firstborn chickens, lamb, ox, everything, including the firstborn sons of the Egyptian families. And he went through the entire city with his sword, knocking out all the firstborn. The only thing that would save the Israelites was what commanded by God to Moses, take the blood of the lamb, smear a sign of the cross, which is the T sign in, in the Hebrew, smear the cross sign on the doorpost of your house. And then the avenging angel, when he passes over, he'll see the blood and he'll say, I won't touch this house and move on. That's called Passover. The, the angel passed over the house. So that's why our Lord celebrated the Passover on Holy Thursday and instituted the fulfillment of the Passover, which was the Lamb, Jesus Christ himself, who would be sacrificed on Good Friday. And he offered the Mass of the sacrifice on Holy Thursday night. So the next day would be his actual sacrifice, but God took that sacrifice and moved it on the altar of the Last Supper where Christ offered the first Mass. A mysterious and beautiful reality. It's called the Mysterium Fidei, that the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, which didn't happen yet, it would be the next day at 12 to 3, yet in a mystical way it was, it was really reenacted on the altar at the first death on Holy Thursday. And that's what happens ever since Good Friday. The sacrifice of Christ in the Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of the faith, that event of Good Friday is moved and taken and, and reenacted on the altar in the Mass. Every single Mass down to the end of the world brings and reenacts the real presence of Christ's sacrifice of Calvary. So this is why the Lamb is a perfect symbol of the effect and grace and sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. So St. Thomas Aquinas concludes, So as to the effect, because by the blood of the Paschal Lamb, the children of Israel were preserved from the destroying angel and brought from the Egyptian slavery. And in this respect, the Paschal Lamb is the chief and best figure of this sacrament because it represents it, represents it in every respect. And there's many other prefigurings in the Old Testament. The bread and wine offered by Melchizedek, the high priest. The manna that God fed the, des the Israelites in the desert with the, the, the food of the manna. And many other prefigurings of Christ on the cross and the Holy Eucharist. And this is what the Mass really is. And this is why Satan wants to work hard to destroy it. And if St. Andrew was alive today and all the apostles... They, they would probably march into Rome and scold these popes, scold them with no hesitation for destroying or trying to destroy the Catholic faith, the Catholic Mass, the Catholic sacraments that Christ instituted. They're trying to overthrow all this. And Pope Francis is now even going out of control, trying to smash any opposition to his new religion and forced like a dictator. So we see even these Navizoto bishops being punished. They, 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 they couldn't stop at Archbishop Lefebvre, who was the first one they tried to shoot down. Now they're attacking Bishop Strickland and now Cardinal Burke. <laughs> and these are, these are Navizotos. They're not all Tridentine Mass. They're not against Vatican II. They're not condemning the new Mass. They should, and maybe this will be a wake-up call 
for these prelates and pray that it will. Pray, because maybe some of these converted Navasordos who are conditionally reconsecrated and ordained if they need to be in tradition, perhaps they will even outshine our own traditional bishops who have grown quite silent and quite negligent of the flock. And I hear it everywhere I go, Father, well, we never hear about, well, you mean Bishop Zendaios really exists? We, th <laughs> we, only, we thought he might have died or fell off the earth. We don't hear about him or ne nothing from him, nothing. Or the, any of the other bishops, hardly. And granted, some of them speak another language. They don't, some of them don't come to eat in the United States too often, so maybe there's a, a little room for uh, some understanding there. But maybe some of these Navasordos will outshine some of these traditional bishops who have basically turned their back on Archbishop Lefebvre. I don't like saying that, but it's true. And I hope they can prove me wrong. Yet, there's always time, but, you know, some of these bishops are all for the agreement with Rome, have made the conditions for the agreement with Rome, they're getting all their jurisdiction, signed the doctrinal declaration, and some of the other bishops have been really heavily promoting grace in the new mass and new mass miracles, but why? What's the good fruit from that? What does it do for, for any Catholic to hear that except cause confusion? And granted, some of these are opinions that can be debated. And let's be very, very honest, very honest. When, in the case of Bishop Williamson, when he introduced these new ideas back in 2014, he himself said, prefacing the point, he said, it's my opinion, other priests, my colleagues, may shoot me down and hang me and behead me for saying this, and uh, they won't like or agree with me. So when he says these things and priests actually say, don't agree with him and say this is wrong teaching, then they get punished. Then they get refused holy oils. Then they get marginalized. So strange event. And he announces it, my opinion, I'll probably get my head chopped off if there's people that don't agree with me and priests and bishops. So any bishops and priests who don't agree publicly, they get smashed, basically. And Archbishop Lefebvre would never have tolerated these teachings. Never. He himself said, I don't understand why my priests are asking me, can we tell people it's okay to go to a most traditional conservative new mass, where the priest still wears old vestments, says the Latin, prays the rosary, where's his cassock, where's his beretta, and Archbishop Lefebvre said, no, my priests, how often do I have to tell them? They cannot approve this new Mass. They cannot give any hats off to the new Mass because it really is a, a, erodes the faith, erodes the faith. And even for those innocent, not knowing, ignorant, blissfully ignorant Navasordos who go to the new Mass, it's not good for their faith. And if they come to tradition, if they realize this is wrong, it's because usually they're praying the rosary. And Our Lady gives them the grace to realize this new Mass is garbage. Get out of there and find the real Mass and find the ones without compromise. So pray for these bishops being crushed by Pope Francis. Perhaps some of them may outshine some of our own traditional ones. And now we have the four consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre, plus six consecrated by Bishop Williamson. That's quite an army of bishops. And imagine if they really all stood for and publicly preached and stood for the real position of Archbishop Lefebvre, that would be a powerhouse. The Freemasons would, wouldn't know what to do. They would be powerful. But the Freemasons rejoice in these new doctrines being preached and the compromises and the silence. They're happy with all that because it means the resistance is a joke. The Catholic resistance is kept 
dissipated, fighting, and confused. But the real Catholic resistance is not confused. We're fighting, but we're not confused. The truth stands on its own, and we got to stand with it. And Archbishop Lefebvre handed this treasure to us, and he ordered his bishops, no compromise with modernist Rome, no agreements, no even discussions until Rome comes back to tradition. And if the Holy Father were to grant me the Latin Mass and my seminaries, he said, I would say no, because we cannot work together. You're on AM, I am, I, we're on FM. You're on Vatican II religion, we're on the religion of Catholic faith and tradition. They don't, they cannot work, we cannot work together, Archbishop Lefebvre told Cardinal Ratzinger. We are working in diametrically opposed directions. We cannot work together. And that's what Bishop Follet should have said to Pope Benedict XVI and would have done a great favor for the church to bring the point of the faith to the forefront. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre really stood for, the, the faith first and everything else is second, including the sacraments, the mass, the jurisdictions, all second. First, the faith. So let's pray to St. Andrew, who died for the Catholic faith. It must have been quite something to hear the apostles preach. When they could say, I saw our Lord. I heard him say these things. I heard him say these parables. I saw his miracles. I saw him make the sign of the cross. And St. Andrew was there with St. Philip, presenting the loaves of fish and loaves of bread and the, the fish of the boy nearby. It was St. Andrew who, who said, this boy has some fish, but it's not enough to feed the crowd. So imagine the, hearing the apostles saying, I was there and, we, and our Lord told us, go feed the crowds with baskets. And every time I looked down in the basket, there was more fish and more bread. I can't explain it, but I saw it. I saw him raise people from the dead. I saw him raise Lazarus. And to hear the apostles. And then what about Good Friday? Where were you at the foot of the cross? Well, I ran away from our Lord and I was ashamed of denying him. But I repented with tears at his feet when we, he appeared to us at the resurrection. And we touched his wounds and recovered our faith that we had rejected. And now the apostles proved they sealed the truth of the Catholic faith, every one of them, with their blood. And that's one of the arguments in defense of the Catholic faith, that it's true. That the apostles weren't just a bunch of men who got together and wrote a Bible and to deceive people and write a fiction. Why? Because... If they were out to write a fiction to deceive people and make money, which they never did, off the Gospels, all they got was whippings, imprisonment, being exiled, and put to death. So they had, there was nothing in it for them. And in fact, our Lord commanded them, live the poverty as well. So there was nothing in, them, in it for them to speak in that, that way. But they proved the, the veracity of the Catholic faith by their blood. If it was just a, a, a fable story, they would never die for a fable and a fiction and something made up by man's imagination. These men were not that stupid. And they were down-to-earth men. St. Andrew was a fisherman. He, his hands were calloused, handling the nets, going fishing all night long, being caught in storms reading these stars to find the direction home. These were real, down-to-earth men. They would never give their life for a fiction. But the fact that they suffered, were imprisoned and crucified and beaten to death for the love of Jesus crucified proves the truth of the Holy Catholic faith and the faith of tradition and not the Vatican II faith and phony mass and phony religion. So let's pray to St. Andrew and let's take his words, oh, good cross. Whenever our Lord gives us crosses, we should say with St. Andrew, oh, happy cross, oh, good cross, because through you, you take me to heaven. That's what we got to say, as hard as it might be sometimes. 
O good cross, made beautiful for me by the body of my Lord, O cross, so long desired, so ardently loved, so ceaselessly sought, and now made ready at last for the soul longing for thee. This is what we should say whenever God gives us a cross or a splinter of a cross. Receive me from among men, restore me to my master, that he through you, O cross, may welcome me, he who through you redeemed me. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us and I'll be close to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary, conceived without sin, and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.